Go, Lord, in prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, what today is, Lord. Not only is it your day, a day that you've set aside for us to uh, worship and to praise you and to learn more about you and just to, to bask in the love and the forgiveness and the grace that you have bestowed upon us, Lord, but it's also the day before the, the birthday of this nation that you have blessed us to live in, Lord, and it is truly a blessing to live here. I know we're going through a lot of trouble right now and a lot of... Uh, issues going on father but it does not change the fact that you have blessed this country lord and you are still on your throne father and father for that we say thank you and we love you and we pray this in jesus name amen good to see everybody today um i would say happy fourth of july that's tomorrow so i guess i could say happy pre-fourth of july there we go uh, independence day there you go thank you for reminding me that good to see keith up here singing with us today uh and uh, I, I, it's been a while since I've seen you singing bass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just caught my attention when you were up. But it's good to have you back here. All right, let me run over. Just uh, we only have a couple of announcements. Uh, me and we will not have man's church in the morning since it is Independence Day. Uh, so you get one week off before we get back into that next Monday morning. So no man church in the morning, but we will have Wednesday night activities this week, uh, beginning at 5:30 with our prayer time. Uh, and uh, Awana starting off, or the, the Talk About Awana program. I know when we put Awana, everybody thinks it's regular Awana, but it's the summer version of Awana, which is called Talk About, and that goes on until 7 o'clock, and the worship service beginning at 6, and we'll be in the uh, uh, choir room continuing on with that. Really, the only thing I wanted to call your attention to is there were, have been some of you that uh, had asked about or uh, wanted to be uh, trained on the chainsaw ministry, uh, so that you could go out with us whenever the next hurricane rolls around. I know that every one of you know how to run a chainsaw. You've probably been cranking them up since you were uh, uh, Jude's age. But we have, to, uh, we have to go. You have to go through a training so that the state convention can put you on their insurance and all this so that whenever we do have a, a disaster roll up, we can uh, send you out and, and know that everything's good to go. But anyhow, next 
Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. At, uh, it's in Rabel. It's East Rabel Baptist Church. That would be the one when you get off there where the big cross is on the side of the road. That would be the church. It's right back there behind that. At 2 o'clock next week is where our chainsaw training for our associational uh, chainsaw ministry. That's next week. So don't forget about that, man. That way we can go ahead and get you licensed and insured and raring to go so that the next time something comes up, we can hook to the trailer and we can go minister to people in a difficult situation. All right, that's all we got. I pray that every one of you enjoy uh, your festivities tomorrow with family and friends. Be safe. Uh, it'll be hot, so be safe. I'll just say that again. If you hadn't figured this out by now, it's hot, so be safe. Because uh, it doesn't take much to get too hot out there. Amen? All right, let me uh, have a little moment with my favorite folks in the church, the kiddos down here for a moment. Come on, guys. You don't know what? All the adults just got jealous because I told them y'all were my favorites and you are. All right. So what y'all plan on doing tomorrow? Y'all going to do fireworks this week? Think so? Y'all like, like shooting fireworks? Yeah? Kind of? Y'all not real excited about shooting fireworks? Oh, you are. Okay. I'm excited about shooting fireworks. You're excited about shooting fireworks. The girls aren't really excited about shooting fireworks, huh? They're kind of loud sometimes. Yeah, okay. Well, I hope you have fun, whatever it is. You know what we're celebrating, don't you? The 4th of July. 4th of July, which is our country's birthday. Did y'all know that? We're, it's not, we're not the only ones that have birthdays and have parties for our birthdays. Our nation gets to have its birthday party tomorrow. We've been around for a little while, not as long as some countries, but like 240-something years. Are any of y'all that old yet? No? Brother Jeff's getting close, but I'm not quite there yet. That's right. But anyhow, I hope that tomorrow that y'all don't forget that we, we live in an awesome country, uh, and God has really, really blessed us, and we don't ever, ever, ever need to forget that. So whenever God, whenever we get to enjoy the freedoms we have here, we need to remember that we didn't do this. God did this for us. So let's always thank God for that, okay? All right, let's pray before you go to the back. Lord, I thank you for these boys and girls this morning. And, and Lord, I know that in a day and time when so many people are trying to forget about the history of our nation, Lord, that you'll help them remember that you have blessed us, Lord. You set us apart. You started this nation, Lord, and it's on your uh, word that we have been founded. So help us to never forget that and to always thank you for that, Lord. Help them to listen today, to be on their best behavior. I pray for the teachers today, Lord. Give them the words to say to these wonderful boys and girls. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys later. Y'all be good.
actually helped me choose songs for this week because she was supposed to be up here, but she was sick this week, so it's just me. But we decided that we wanted to pick, we wanted to do hymns that were America hymns, but we wanted to pick some songs about freedom in Christ and the freedom that Christ gives us because sometimes in our country, it feels like things, certain people are trying to take away our freedoms, but no one can ever take away the freedom that we have in Christ.
had saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The hour I first believed. Greatly appreciate that. The soon the earth will dissolve like snow. Y'all believe that? I don't know about you, but the Lord's coming back real, real soon. This morning, Second Chronicles chapter seven. I've actually been uh, praying about preaching this text for quite some time, and uh, 
just so happened the Lord gave me the opportunity to do so today in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I believe everyone knows this passage. You've heard it quite a bit here recently on TV and such, but let's see what the Lord has for us this morning. You know, over the past couple of weeks, um, we have witnessed the um, reactions of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. I don't know how many times I changed that word in my text today where I put reactions. Um, I had some other words in there, prayed about it. I'm like, no, that's not exactly the word I'm looking for, but the Lord kind of let me stop on the word reactions. You would think that with a decision, with this decision, as big a decision as it is, that it would bring about a sense of joy or happiness or maybe even relief uh, in our country. But I'm sure that you have watched the news and read the articles, as I have, about this decision and have probably witnessed, as I have, just how divided our nation is. In fact, the reason why I'm not going to preach on that decision is because I would dare say there are differences of opinions within these four walls as well. That might be painful for me to say and even more painful for you to hear it, but I believe that might be true. But what I took from this decision and the actions or the repercussions or the outcome of this is just how far removed from Christ we are as a nation. I think this was a pretty good barometer or maybe a very good way to check this nation's temperature, I guess you could say, and it is proven how far we really are from Christ. A nation that tomorrow, if I did my math correct, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, will celebrate its 246th richly blessed birthday. Richly blessed birthday. Richly blessed. I have spent probably half of my adult life serving overseas somewhere, either in the military or on the mission field. We are extremely blessed in this country. A nation that I feel was founded on Christian beliefs, amen, but a, a nation that has completely turned our back on God. Romans 13, 11, Paul writes to Christians, and I don't know, that this verse has really just jumped out at me this week, and even this morning as I got up early, early, and I was reading this verse, Paul says to us, besides this, guys, besides what took place in the past couple of weeks, besides the decisions that are being made that, that determine our our nation and everything that's going on, besides all of this, Christians, you know the time. Does that make sense? Does that fit in there? I don't think I'm stretching this, do you? So Paul really is writing this for us today. Besides this, and he's writing to Christians, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. To wake up from sleep for salvation, that means <laughs> Jesus is coming, okay, is nearer to us now than when we first believed. No truer words have ever been spoken. Amen? Most of you would tell me your testimony and say that, yes, I accepted Christ at this time or this many years ago. Well, guess what? Jesus is coming back a lot sooner now than it was then. And besides everything else that's going on, this is the truth. Now, wake up. The hour has come for us to wake up. You want me to give you another word for that? It's called revival. 
That's actually what the word revival means. When we wake up from our sleep, when we are roused from our state of apathy or ill concern. But who needs revival? If we were to do a, a survey around America, and they do them all the time for ridiculous stuff, why not let's do one like this and ask, who needs revival? There might be a few people say, I do. Most people would say, I really don't care, amen, or that I'm not worried about it or we're doing good. In my studying over the past couple of weeks, I run across this checklist, and it's actually in your bulletin. Let me just say this. If you did not grab one this morning, Kim told me this week, she said, you got a long outline. You're right, because I actually put this checklist in the bulletin for the purpose of you taking it home. But I come across a checklist that asks, when do we need revival? Well, when the things of God do not stir you anymore, you probably need revival. When the glories of heaven do not interest you anymore, you probably need revival. When the tremendous horrors and truthfulness of hell do not concern you anymore, I would say you need revival. When the pearl of the lost does not move you, you need revival. When the word of God does not attract you. Whew. I don't know about you, but some of these hurt. When the word of God does not attract you anymore, you probably need revival. Or when the idea of prayer does not draw you to God, you need revival. Or when the house of God does not delight you anymore, Y'all can look around and see what I see. You need revival. Or when you do not see every part of your life as a platform to perform the will of God, you probably need revival. So who needs revival? Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I was going to put you on the spot. But I'm not going to put you on the spot. But I am going to ask you to take that list home with you. There's some, still some bulletins if you didn't get one this morning. I'm going to ask you to take it home. I actually want you to pray through that this week. And let me just say this. If any one of those is true of your life, you know what that means? We need revival. We need to wake up from the sleep in that sense of apathy that we have fallen into. Psalms 85, 6, the writer cried out to God and he asked, Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? And then the Lord responds to that in Isaiah 57, verse 15, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, to my God here, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. The word contrite, we, we use it as being remorseful or regretful for our sinfulness. Those are the people that God says he dwells with. Those that have a remorseful or a broken or a humble spirit. You see, God does want to wake us up. God's not sitting back up there in heaven going, man, I sure wish they would wake up. wonder if I could send a hurricane or something to wake them up. No, that's not how God is doing. He desires for us to, to wake up. He wants to revive us. And I believe that today's spirit will show us step by step exactly what we can do so that we can be aroused from this state of complacency that unfortunately we all, myself included, have fallen into. Amen? I ask you who needs revival, I will be the first one to tell you I absolutely need it. Absolutely. The background for our passage, and I'm going to read here in just a second, that you're going to follow with me here in a minute. The background for this text is the dedication of Solomon's temple. Now, in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, 
they had brought the Ark of the Covenant into its place, and, and they began to praise the Lord. And the temple was filled, filled with this thick cloud, so thick that the priests could not even continue their work because of the glory, because of the, the presence of the Lord filled the house of God. Who could you imagine the day when you couldn't get through the doors because God's presence was so thick that you could feel it? <laughs> what a day it's going to be when my Jesus I get to see. But you know what? It don't have to be there. It can be here now. And this, this dedication, this service lasted... Oh, don't say this, Brother Jeff. It lasted seven days, guys. Y'all fuss if I go seven minutes over. Seven days. They worshiped God. Brother Keith, they sang. For seven days, they praised God. They, they, they sacrificed over 120,000 sheep. A lot less bad going on in the fields around Jerusalem then, wasn't it? What a worship service. Seven days. And then after the people went home, it must have been a great time because, I mean, good gracious. After they all went home, God appeared and he spoke these words to Solomon. And that's what we're going to read this morning. Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse 12. Please stand with me this morning. So that we can read what the Lord said to Solomon as a result of what took place. Verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night, and he said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Boy, that verse is so applicable for us today. Father, thank you this morning for this opportunity to be in your house and to look at your word and to see how this applies to us today, Lord. I asked the question when we got started, does America need revival? And we would all say yes, but I believe that's going to start with us. See, help us today, Lord, to, to just see how this does apply to us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, what I'm going to do this morning, I mean, you can clearly see the outline that I'm going to follow. I'm just going to run through this particular verse. I mean, it's clear as day what we need to do here, but I felt like let's look at this again how can we be revived? Well, first of all, there in verse 14, the first thing we need to do is to humble our hearts before God. Now, I want you to notice something, Christians. He's talking to us. He's talking to those of us sitting in here. We are God's people. He says, if my people, if my people, who are called by my, if my people will humble themselves. Now, in the Old Testament days, the my people, or the people that he's talking to about, were those who trusted in the promise of a coming Savior. They were looking forward to the day when the Messiah would come and heal their land and forgive them of their sins. But now, today, we're talking about people who have believed the good news of salvation. We're talking about people who have trusted the Savior, the one who came and died on Calvary's cross for our sins. If my people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior. Friends, we are God's people. We are God's people. That's who he's talking to. Now, so many times when we talk about revival, people in the church will say, yeah, man, them folks out there on the streets, they sure do need revival. This doesn't say anything about people outside God's house. You can't revive that which is already dead, right? The only ones that can be revived or woken up are people that have new life. That's us. 
We are the ones who are his children. We are the ones who need to be revived. And God says, I want you to humble yourselves. <sighs> humble myself. The word picture is the bending of the knee or bowing down low before the greatness of God. Okay, Brother Jeff. Why? Why do I need to humble myself? Didn't I already give my heart to Jesus one time? I mean, I, I come down the aisle and I took you by the hand. I, I got wet. Isn't that humbling enough? Why do I need to humble myself? Well, one reason is because we are tempted to be self-sufficient, guys. We like to say, look at me. We are more blessed than we've ever been. And typically, the more blessed we are, the more we like to give ourselves credit for those blessings. Have you ever noticed that? All of a sudden, that wallet gets a little bit thicker that you're sitting on. And what do you do? Man, I made some pretty good decisions over on the stock market. Or look at me. I was able to save a few little bit this week. By All right, you see what I'm saying? It's I, 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 what I did. We become very self-sufficient. That's why the Lord reduced Gideon's army from 32,000 men down to 300 men. That's what prompted Jesus to say in Matthew 19, 24, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. The more blessed we are, the more we are tempted to think that we did this on our own. But the truth is this, guys, we can't do anything without God. We can't do anything without God. Friends, you can't walk without God's help. <laughs> I'm reminded of this. My, my mom, you all know, is, is in the nursing home, and I try to go by as often as I can. And, you know, right now she's in a wheelchair. She can't walk. Friends, you can't even walk without God and to think that you did anything apart from God. Yeah, we need to be revived. We need to humble ourselves. You can't breathe without God. And yet when it's time to praise God singing, we'll hold our breath like it's ours to hold anyway. Every moment we live is a precious gift from God. We must humble ourselves before God because we are tempted to be self-sufficient and also because we are tempted to be self-righteous. Are we not? It's just easy for us to think that we are better off than other people. Just like the Pharisee was in the parable that Jesus told us in Luke chapter 18. He says, I thank you, God, that I'm not a, a sinner like everybody else. I thank you, God, that I'm not a liar or a cheater. I thank you that I'm not down there on the street having uh, some sort of addiction or something like that. I'm just such a good old person, God. Especially like that tax collector over there, for, for I never cheat. I never sin. I never commit adultery. I fast twice a week. Hey. And I'll be glad to give you a tenth of my income. We are so self-righteous. We need to humble our hearts before God. And remember that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from our Heavenly Father. Amen? Humble ourselves. That's the first thing we've got to do to be, to, to, for God to wake us up or to revive us again. How do we get revival? Humble ourselves. And then we need to put a, a priority on prayer. He says there, if my people who are called unto my name will humble themselves and pray. Now, he tells us to do this in verse 14, as we just read. But if you look back up to verse 12, you'll get the reason why you should pray. In verse 12, he says that the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. How many other reasons do you need to pray other than the fact that God hears your prayer? To know 
that God hears our prayers, that God's listening to our prayers. Now, wait a minute. Let's, 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 let's think about this. So how much has God heard from you lately? He's waiting to hear our prayers. He's listening to our prayers. So how much has he heard from us lately? As long as we're not praying selfish, evil prayers, God hears our prayers as his people. That's why we pray. And then if we understand that God hears our prayers, then the more we realize how much we pray, the more God hears us. Therefore, the more that we do pray, the more that God hears us. Therefore, the more things we're going to see take place in our lives as a result of those prayers. We wonder, well, we ain't seeing God do anything. Are you praying? Because God's waiting to hear. Our prayers can make an everlasting difference in countless lives. I, I was looking for an illustration to throw in here, and there's so many out there. I, I just I thought, you know what? It's, it's Independence Day. Let me, let me tell a, a military story here. So that's what I did. They say uh, uh, in the First World War, there was a story about God answering prayer. It said a, a German machine gun crew had their weapons trained at a particular angle on a trench where troops were frequently passing back and forth. And, and because of the angle that they had, the casualties, every time soldiers would fly through there, they were mowing them down. The casualties were really beginning to, to mount up. Lots of people were losing their lives as a, as a result of this. And in a last resort, they asked for volunteers to be called in to storm the machine gun out there that was in the open. There's no way you're going to get to them because of the angle that they had. Someone had to volunteer to just go for it. Well, they say 15 men volunteered to go after this, knowing that most of them would die. Well, one of the young officers volunteered to lead this group of men knowing that he's about to run right into machine gun fire. So before they were going to climb over the trench and go into this open field toward a machine gun group there, he, he addressed the volunteers by saying, he says, Men, I am a Christian, and before every undertaking, I pray. Those of you who are willing, kneel with me and pray about this one. Then he uncovered his head and he knelt down, asking God to spare their lives. But if anyone must die during this process that their souls might be saved. When he finished, he looked up and noticed that all 15 men had knelt down to pray with him. They made their plan. They jumped over the trench and raced for the machine gun. They overcame the gun crew. They destroyed the entire enemy set up, and then they were able to run back to their trenches. No one missing are injured as a result of this. Guaranteed death before, but all men prayed and every man made it back. It was a miracle indeed. And the officer later said, none of them will ever say that the day of miracles has passed. Prayer is far more important and has much more impact than we realize. Think about it like this, guys. God wouldn't ask us to pray if he didn't intend on listening to us, right? God doesn't toy with us like that. He desires that we pray. And revival has always come with prayer, but it has never come without prayer. Want to be revived? Do we need revival? We always say yes. Then we have got to put a priority on prayer. Now back to verse 14. God says, if my people which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now, Jesus promised us in Matthew 7, 7, that if we uh, would seek the face of God, that we would find him, that if we would seek him, that we would find him. Now, what does it mean to, to seek the face of God? Because I know oftentimes we read this and we're probably scratching our head going, well, tell me what it means to seek the face of God. Well, if you're going to seek something, first thing you got to do is you got to leave something else behind in order to go seek something. Amen? 
There's a leaving involved in the seeking. In other words, you stop doing what you're doing to go and look for something. It's kind of like this, men. Every time you go out the door and you can't find your keys. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Honey, where's my keys at? Y'all know you do that. Or maybe it's just the opposite. And you say, can you help me find my keys? Well, whoever it is, whether it's the wife you're asking or the husband you're asking, they've got to stop what they're doing, right, to go help you find your keys, right? Is that, I mean, that's a pretty simple illustration. You understand what I'm doing. Whether he or she is working on breakfast or doing something else, they have to leave behind what they're doing to go and find. Seeking involves leaving. And on this spiritual journey, as we are seeking the Lord, there are some things that we're going to have to leave behind. Amen? Some things that we think are pretty important to us that are not so important after all compared to seeking the Lord. Amen? Some old priorities, some old habits, some old things need to be left behind in order to seek the Lord. But there also involves some loving going on here. We need to seek the Lord because we love him. And we ought to love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved us. That's why we ought to love him. He proved that when he died on Calvary's cross for us. So not only do we need to leave behind some stuff, but we need to love God. But it's also about a sense of, of closeness with Christ. Now, this is where this gets a little tricky. We have what we call personal space, do we not? And here in America, we like our personal space. We like a lot of it, do we not? Yeah, we do. We like our personal space. This is not true in other parts of the world, but here in America, we, we like our comfort zone. Like right now, every one of y'all are comfortable with me being up here because you're a pretty good piece from me. Some of you are not quite as comfortable. That's why you're on the very back pew. Amen. You want to get as far away from me as you can. Because that's the only way you're comfortable with me. But if we're going to seek the Lord, there is this sense of closeness that we're not really comfortable with. For instance, and I love Miss Merle. But if I get real close to Miss Merle like this, I guarantee you she's a little nervous about what I'm going to say. <laughs> right? right? See there, she admitted to it. Why is that? Number one, she didn't know what I'm going to say. Number one, I love Miss Merle, and, and she loves me. I'm, I'm her pastor and all this. But there's not this intimacy and closeness that I have with Miss Merle, whereas if my wife was not suffering from kidney stones, and she would be here today. The reason why we won't seek God is because we honestly don't desire to be that close with him. Right? You get close to someone when you have an intimate relationship with them. God said, you want revival? Seek my face. Get close to me. That's the way we bring about revival. It's about a closeness. But there also has to be a desire for this seeking God. A desire to do so. Again, this, this word picture for seek in the verses is to search for something with great desire. Seeking, asking, begging, do whatever it is to find this item. In Jeremiah 29, 13, God said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Not half-heartedly or part-time, all of your heart. Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, not last, or not second or third, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. My question is, how much passion and desire do you have to seek for God? I remember one day, prior to me surrendering to the ministry when I was working at the paper mill, Teresa and I just had Missy at the time, and I come home from work. I'd been working day shift that day, and 
We lived out on Highway 34. Brother Randy knows exactly what I'm talking about. We actually had the last five-acre block before you get to Okaloosa Road. That'd tell you exactly where we lived. Nice place up on the hill, pine trees all around, creek in the back, big old thicket back there. I used to kill deer back there. Highway 34, trucks flying all the time up and down that road. I remember coming in from work one day, and it had been a hot day, and I walked in the, the trailer there, and Teresa was in the kitchen, and I asked her, I said, hey, she said, hey, how was your day? I said, it's fine. I said, where's Missy at? She said, she's on the back porch. I had built a porch on the back of the trailer back there. She said, she's on the back porch. I said, okay. So I walked out the back door, and she wasn't there. And I looked around, and I didn't see her anywhere. So I walked back in the house, and I said, well, I don't see Missy on the back porch. She said, oh, I'm sure she's around. So she went on back to cooking supper, and I went and got in the recliner and turned TV on. I got the response I was looking for from y'all. No, I didn't. See, there was a desire for my daughter. I love my daughter. She's precious. When I couldn't find her, I began to yell, holler, scream, trying to find her. Teresa come running out. What is it? She's not out here. So we parted. We had, we, we had, we had to make a plan. I got to find my daughter. I mean, she's, she, she was, I think she was three or four. She was little. Where is she? These are big woods. Snakes everywhere. I just killed a, a water moccasin the day before. And all this is running through my mind. I tell her, you go to the back. I'm going to the front. Highway 34 is out there. Log trucks flying up and down the road. I can't fathom the thought of something happening. So I run to the front. I'm running up and down the road trying to make sure she hadn't got out to the road somewhere. Teresa heads to the woods in the back yelling and hollering. One thing that runs in my mind, there's this pond over to the side of us over there. Maybe she fell off in the pond. I go over there. I'm, I'm waving through the mud. We're yelling. We're screaming. We're hollering. We are desperately seeking for our daughter because we love her so much. Passion for her. We found her. Following her puppy back in the woods. We asked her, did you take the dog back or did the dog take you back? The dog took me back. She already learned how to get herself out of a desperate situation. But you see, the desire and the passion and the love for her was so great. We didn't have to contemplate or think about, should we go looking for her? Or maybe when the news goes off, I'll go try to find her then. Or, honey, let me finish cooking supper, and then maybe if we feel like it, and it's not too dark, we'll go looking for her. No! You don't run any of those questions through your mind. It's automatic. When you love someone that much, you do whatever it takes to find them. And that is what God says you should have for me. You want revival? You need to be woken up. Then you need to have a passion for God enough to seek him with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and all of our strength. We must seek the Savior. And then the last thing he says there is we need to return to righteousness. In other words, turn, return or turn from our wicked ways. Every one of us has to make a U-turn in our lives. Amen? We must. We must. Now, God is talking about repentance here. Peter Marshall, he explained repentance in these words. He says, if you're walking down the street and, and someone came up behind you and, and, and tapped you on the shoulder... What would you do? Now, in today's world, we turn around about ready to fight. But if someone walked up behind you and, and, and tapped you on the shoulder, the first thing you've got to do is naturally you've just got to turn around, right? To see, well, what is this? So you, you, you turn around. And see, that's exactly what happens in the spiritual world. We are all walking in the wrong direction, guys. You might think you're one of them people who are not 
challenged as far as directions. But I hate to tell you this, but from the moment you were born, you are walking in the wrong direction. And many, many times through your life, God has walked up and, hey, time to turn around. You're going in the wrong direction. And we go through life with this, this eternal call ringing in our ears. And, and so many times we're not listening or we're not responding. Then suddenly without warning, the Holy Spirit does tap us on the shoulder and we turn around. See that word repentance means to turn around. And everybody needs to make that first turn around. Amen. We all need to repent of our sins. You need to turn away from sin and selfishness and turn to Jesus. He loves you. He, he, he died on the cross for you. I mean, what more reason do you need to turn to Jesus Christ? We need to open our heart and put our faith and trust in him, and he'll forgive us of our sins, and he'll give us eternal life. Every single one of us needs to make that initial turn, that initial repentance, that initial flip it around there, guys, a U-turn. You do them all the time. I watch you in the parking lot. But we also need to make some fresh turns in our lives, turning away from whatever is wrong in our lives, turning away from jealousy or greed or gossip or dishonesty or sexual sins or self-righteousness or laziness or lack of love or lack of concern for other people. All those things we need to turn away from. And I stopped right there because that list could have gone on and on and on for things that we need to turn away from. Listen, guys, facing our sin is not fun. Amen? We do not like being told we are messing this one and only life we have up. The Bible calls it godly sorrow in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It's called godly sorrow, and it ain't fun. Seeing our sinfulness is no fun. It never is, but we must so that we can turn away from it. And when we think about Jesus and all that he has done for us and all the ways that he has blessed us, it helps us to turn away from sin and toward him. How far will Jesus go to forgive us? He went all the way to the cross of Calvary for us. I found the story of a youth minister in Missouri. It was 1997. I don't have the guy's name. I just I found the story, and I thought it was very fitting here. But he wanted to help his youth, the young people, understand uh, about the love of God. Um, they were having a tough time understanding just how much God loved them. And the theme for that youth group that month was the cross. So this very energetic uh, youth minister, lots of ideas and everything, he had them build a 500-pound, 8-foot by 14-foot redwood cross, 500 pounds. Now, we would be going, why would you make it so heavy? Can't nobody carry it. Well, you're right. It took 10 students to move the thing. Why so big? He wanted them to understand the heaviness of the cross that Christ carried. One night at church, they were able to get the cross up on the platform. And he told the students that each one of them deserved to experience that cross. But because of God's love, he sent his one and only son to die on that cross for us instead. But they still weren't getting it. It just wasn't seeming to, to click with them about God's love for them. They couldn't understand it. And as he was standing up there explaining to them about the cross of Calvary, it come to somebody. A uh, certain person come to mind. Her name was Minette. Minette was a, a single mom who was sitting in the back of the church. She was actually one of the sponsors for the youth group that particular month. She brought food up there and helped them out and everything. And he told her, he said, Minette, uh, could you come forward? She's sitting in the back watching her kids in the group and watching them respond. But when he called her by name, she went in and stood up. And as she was working her way down the aisle, she decided to hand her newborn baby, whose name was Hudson, off to one of the ladies reasonable thing to do 
I mean, I'm about to go up front here. Could you watch my child for me? But the youth minister says, no, 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 no. Don't hand off Hudson. We want Hudson up front. So they brought this little baby boy to the front. And they placed him in the center of that cross. Didn't leave him there long. No way to scare him, scare anyone. No, no harm or anything like that. But they were able to position him where he was hanging on that cross for just a little while. Later, the youth minister said every young person there that night understood the love of God. That night, it weighed nine pounds and six ounces, and they understood. You know, over time, over 2,000 years ago, God's love might have really weighed just nine pounds and six ounces. And he grew up and was nailed to that cross for us. My people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Here the day before our nation's birthday, how will God change our nation? Guys, it needs it, amen? Amen. How will God change our nation? By changing our state. So how will God change our state? By changing our parish. How will God change this parish? By changing a town. How can God change Delhi? By changing a church. How can God change First Baptist Church, Delhi? By changing a family. How can God change the families of this church? By changing me. I know this is a lot to take in, and I know that none of us will change all at once. But maybe today we could determine to take at least one step toward revival. Someone once asked the old-time evangelist Gypsy Smith to explain the best way to get to revival. Best way to get to revival. He said this. He said, I want you to take a piece of chalk and draw a circle on the floor. Then you get down on your knees in the middle of that circle and you pray and ask God to change the one in the circle. And revival, when revival breaks out in that circle, it'll carry over to everything else. Here's my question. I wonder how many of us are willing to draw that circle and ask God to change us today. We realize the state we're in. We see it's a mess. The only way it will ever change is by God changing us first. Does America need revival? I think the better question is to ask, do I need revival? Father, I want to thank you this morning for this reminder that the reason why we're in such a mess, Lord, we can't, we can't point our fingers at other people, God reason why we're in this mess begins with me. It begins with us. We need a change of heart. We need to be woken up. We need to be revived. Father, I thank you for this passage this morning. It shows us clearly what we need to do. We don't have to wonder what it's going to take. You, you've spelled it out for us today. I want to thank you for that. Fathers, we have a time of invitation now, and we're going to stand, and we're going to sing, and, and it'll get quiet. It'll get solemn. Father, I ask that you speak to our hearts, Lord. God, do we dare draw that circle around us and ask you to change the one inside the circle? 
Are we afraid of what you do? Father, our altars are open this morning. And if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, today would be a great day to repent and to turn around towards you. Give us the boldness, Father, now, I pray in Jesus' name. If you would, please stand with me.